I thought I would dress as much like Satan as possible uh, to make it really easy to, to do the breakdown. Uh, I've got my USA socks. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, I'll make a more modest statement. I'm sure I'll find an excuse to burn them at some point just to irritate somebody. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm, I'm pleased to do this. For those who don't know, um, once upon a time we would have agreed incredibly strongly, I think, we'll find out because we're, gonna, we're just gonna sit here and kind of have a free-form discussion for 80, 90 minutes or something, and then we'll be taking questions. There's mics set up on either side. So you can get your questions ready and you can, I don't know, if you wanna really be obnoxious, you could Google and fact check either one of us and ah, oh, I got you. But uh, mostly it's, there were people asking, you know, why are you doing this? I have no idea why you're doing this. Uh, why am I doing it? Yeah. Well, okay. For, well, first of all, I wanna, I wanna commend Travis because um, debate has become kind of rare in our society. Um, debate used to be pretty common. In fact, you could go on CNN, you had Crossfire, you know, Michael Kinsley on the left and Pat Buchanan on the right. Now, if you watch a CNN pa panel, it's 12 guys who think the same. I concur, and I concur, and I concur. So, this has made I impoverish, I think, our public debate. So, A, I like the idea of debate, and B, uh, debate on these topics that go beyond politics and engage philosophy, epistemology, God, are even rarer. Yeah, And so, for this reason, I thought, this is fun. Um, when the late Christopher Hitchens was alive, I did a bunch of these debates, on, mainly on campus. And I haven't done one in a lot of years. I've been focused That's on the political... died? Unfortunately. Well, uh, yeah, it was um, un un unfortunate, because I really... He, he and I got along well. We'd, in fact, often sit after the debate and put down a bottle or two of wine and then he'd tell me gossip about the Clintons. Um, and uh, about the time that the mullahs chased him down the street in Iran, and things like that. So we act and we actually had some political common ground. So it was interesting. Yeah, that was, it was, it's one of the things that I noted, because um, while Hitch and I only met briefly, we have a bunch of mutual friends, and there were political areas where I disagreed with him, but I've spent most of my time I spent a good chunk of time like I was, as a Rush Limbaugh did a header, and then I was kind of apolitical, and of course now it seems that everybody is more p political, and a lot of people will say, oh, well, we, you know, in the olden days it was we shouldn't discuss religion and politics, and I'm like, those are the things that matter most and the things that I'm most interested in discussing, although I tend to, to lean more on, on the religion front, uh, because I was a, a Southern Baptist, you, I believe, if I'm, if I'm correct, were Catholic, but are non-denominational Christian now, I mean... Yeah, I was, you know, I was raised in India. My family, going generations back, was converted by Portuguese missionaries and to Catholicism. That's kind of how I got the Portuguese last name, D'Souza, which my parents then married to an Indian first name. Um, but we were just, you know, it was a social Christianity rather than a devout Christianity. And then when I came to America, obviously a largely a more Protestant country, uh, I began to think about these things a little different. And so I would say I actually adopted my faith more in adult life mm. than I did as a kid when I was a believer, but in a very routinized Sunday mass kind of way. So the, the title of this event when it was being promoted and everything is God, Trump, and the Future of America. So, uh, I, I mean, basically... Trump would probably like to switch the order of those. Yes. Uh, but nevertheless... I would like to remove one of them. I but, thought, well, God, I know, we're yeah. prompt to. I, no, remove one from the discussion. I, there's, well, the other one, I, I don't need to remove because I don't have any reason to think he exists, but the discussion is good. Well, don't you make your life talking about him? I, I do spend a lot of time talking about him. It would be like if I have spent my life talking about unicorns. It would be, except that you don't live in a world where the overwhelming majority of people believe in unicorns and are trying to legislate what other people can do based on what they think unicorns want. Such, what's any, what... What is, since, since we're into it. <laughs> this is how it goes. Yeah. What is a specific, concrete example of someone trying to do that? Of trying to... Uh, 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 well, somebody who says, God told me X, and I want you, Matt, therefore, to do Y. Oh, it's who says that? Who takes that position that you're spending your life fighting? Sure. So, I, I, are we... 
in any way suggesting that there's not a particularly loud and well-financed fundamentalist religious right who are stacking the courts in accordance with their ideology, which is influenced from by their religious things. I have, like, I have family members who are primarily single-issue voters. Like, if there's two candidates and one is, uh, you know, set out to end abortion and the other one's not, that's the only thing that matters to them. And so I think it puts people in a position where they're probably voting against their own best interests. Can you name, I mean, just, uh, just pursuing this to see what we're talking about, can you name a single Supreme Court justice who, in your opinion, does not arrive at their judgments for any constitutional or jurisprudential or moral or philosophical reason, but simply consults a divine oracle in order to make a ruling. Can you name one of them? Oh, no, no, no. I, I'm, not, I'm not in any way suggesting people don't genuinely have these beliefs. It's just that if, if people's views, like people within all of them, whether they're Supreme Court justices or not, they're going to have particular views on how the way the world's going to work. You and I are. And sure. there are people, I have no idea if you're one of them, uh, there are people whose view on how the world should work should be everything should be working in accordance with my understanding of this deity. Well, well let's, take a, let's take an example because I think this the discussion can become kind of airy if we don't pin it down. Okay. Let's talk about abortion. Sure. Okay. Did you know, for example, that Christopher Hitchens was pro-life? Uh, I know, for example, that Christopher Hitchens was not pro-life. Well, He was... So there's two different there's two different aspects of this. Uh, first of all, it doesn't matter what Hitchens believed in the first place. But he wasn't against he wasn't in favor of making it illegal. And my primary issue when it comes to like abortion is the legality, not whether or not somebody thinks it's immoral or not. I interviewed Hitchens years ago for a magazine, and we talked about this issue. And he made what I thought was an interesting point coming from an atheist perspective which was, he said, look, it's one thing if you say that you believe in Hindu reincarnation in which we have many different lives, or if you believe that there is a life to come in which if you happen to be terminated in the womb, you're going to go to life everlasting. He goes, I don't believe any of that. I believe we have one life. This is it. This is the only one. And, 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 and so ultimately, it is the greatest value and if you have a life that is coming into being and it's snuffed out, all its choices interrupted at the outset, he goes, you got to think before you do that, right? Now, uh, let's leave the legality issue because I think the abortion debate has become radicalized since Hitchens died. Whether Hitchens would have supported late-term abortion, we don't really know. But what I'm trying to say is that here's Hitchens. And, and I don't really care. You don't really care. But the point I'm trying to make is this. You're saying that religious people apply a worldview and I'm saying, you do too. Hitchens yeah. does too. All of us have a worldview. I'm not. I, I, I think I just said that like two okay. minutes ago. The issue is whether or not. So if somebody's saying that their worldview is right because it comes from the divine, and there's no demonstration that a there is anything divine, or that they have any good understanding of what the divine would want, then I would hope that we would agree that that is at least a fallacious appeal to an authority that can't be demonstrated. Well, but I would argue that that. First of all, none of us in America conducts a voting test in which when somebody comes into the booth and decides, for example, why do you want to have an abortion? Someone could say, because it's fun. Someone could say, because I think it's a form of birth control. Someone could say, in other words, what I'm trying to get at is we don't conduct a rational scrutiny test to make sure that people who vote about climate change, someone says, I believe in climate change. I'm like, don't you own an, a house that's on the water? Yes, you do. Has that house gone down in value? No. Uh, now, if is, if is that the test for whether no, or not no, no. What, I, what I'm trying to say okay. is, we don't subject people's political views to a scrutiny in which we ask, are they irrational? In, in what way? Well, let's say somebody says. I, I'm just trying to make sure I understand what you're saying. Well, you're saying that when it comes to religious believers, right? Right. They, there's a compartment that they have. Let's call it the divine compartment. For some of them, sure. Right. And so they they appeal to this. For, from your point of view, irrational source, and they try to import that source into politics, which according to you is fallacious. They shouldn't be doing that. And I'm saying all kinds of people who are not religious say the wackiest things. But and that's have a the two cocaine fallacy. That's, that's what aboutism. I, I would object to anybody doing things on behalf of irrational reasons. I'm just saying that. So you would like to see our democratic process purified of the irrational. 
I would like to see our universe purified of the irrational. Okay, and how, and how would you go about doing that? Education, by actually teaching people not only critical thinking, but logic and fallacies, so that instead of believing something when they don't have a good reason, they reserve belief until they do have a good reason. You shouldn't believe anything until the evidence actually supports it. Now, you're going to get into arguments about how much evidence is enough, or you know, do I have enough evidence for this, but we've been, on the God subject, I mean... I, 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 I was just having a conversation well, let's the other put, day, let's, and it's like, what is the evidence for God? What is the reason that anybody should believe there's a God at all? Okay. And so far, despite countless debates, um, nobody seems to have come up with a sound reason for that, and yet they go 10 steps further, which is not only is there a God, but it's this God, and my understanding of this God, and this is how we interact, you know, and the Bible is, is the true guidebook, or the Quran is the true guidebook, and it, the question then becomes, we have a proposition, any proposition, whether it's God or climate change or whatever, how do we go about determining whether or not that proposition is reasonable to accept? Okay. And on the God front, I'm, maybe you have something better than anybody else has come up with. What, what, what is the reasonable warrant for accepting that there's a God at all? Okay, let me try to answer that. Um, I start with the fact that here we are flung into the world with no clear understanding of A, where the universe came from, not the earth, but the universe, B, why we're here and what the purpose of our life is, and C, what, if anything, happens to us after we die. I would argue that, so we are in a very peculiar position where human beings were flung into the world and the three of the most important questions we could possibly ask, we have no answer to. Now, now I'm gonna hold agree on. with you. Do you, you agree or you not, not I, agree? I'm gonna agree with you on two of the three, the middle one on purpose, I think, assumes there's a purpose that has, there's, there's been no demonstration there's a purpose to it. What if any purpose we have for sure. our life? Okay, so now we are in agreement that on the three cardinal questions, we are in a certain kind of blindness. We're in a certain kind of blind ignorance because we don't know, correct? So I, I don't, so if we start at, you're saying we're flung into this universe without an understanding of the origin of the universe, the purpose of life, or what the, happens afterwards. Right, where the universe came from, yes. who, if anyone, or sure. what made it, if anyone, B, what the purpose of our life is, if any, and C, what if anything happens to us after we die. We are in violent agreement right now. Perfect. Now the second question arises, what does science have to say about these three questions? Can science either now, and if it can't now, settle these matters in the future? Let's look at them one by one. Let's take them in reverse order. Sure. Can science decide the matter of whether or not there is life after death, yes or no? Uh, it, it depends. Depends on what? So science only deals with uh, the natural world. Correct. And so if in fact there's a supernatural existence after this, then it may forever be beyond the purview of science. Correct. Or if there is another universe that operates according to different laws and we happen to move somehow into that universe, science would have nothing to say about it, correct? No, because not necessarily, because, because okay. if, it's a, if it's a natural, you know, like we have like hypotheses about a multiverse or whatever. Correct. I can't say what science will be able to test for in the future or whether or not there, we are permanently confined to the cosmos that we experience. I can't say. I can't even rule out, I can't say that science could never say anything about the supernatural. All I can say is that as it stands right now, I'm unaware of any supernatural claim that has any evidence for it that science could evaluate to determine that it was true. So, right, let's put it a little differently because, because we, I don't want to debate the detail here. I just want to look at the macro picture. And what I'm basically saying is Shakespeare said, I think correctly, death is the undiscovered country. No one has been to the other side of the curtain and, and essentially reported, given us empirical evidence one way or the other, correct? We no, don't know what happens I after death. So, so here's the thing, and I promise I'm not being difficult. This is just, just for clarity. Um, as a skeptic, my position is not, you know, like when the... the, the psychics who claim that they're speaking with the dead. Right. Um, my position is not, they're wrong and that's bullshit. My position is, they cannot demonstrate that what they're actually doing is what they claim. 
And so I can't say nobody's been to the other side and communicated back. I can just say there's no reliable evidence for it, and I don't know what shape that evidence would take in order to demonstrate that. Okay, I want to come back to that because that you've now made to me a very striking claim, namely that we should, I think you're saying, disbelieve all claims for which there is not sufficient evidence. So, not, I, not just that we should take an agnostic position, but we should disbelieve them. That's two different uh, things. Oh, so if you mean disbelieve as in believe they are not true, that's the exact opposite of what I just said. Okay. What I said was we should believe things when there's evidence for it, and that is both the proposition that the supernatural is real and the proposition that the supernatural is not real. Okay. You can call, so agnosticism isn't some middle ground between believing X and believing not X. There is no middle ground. You are either convinced of X or you are not convinced of X. And I'm, I'm not convinced that the supernatural is real. That doesn't mean that I'm convinced that the supernatural isn't real. It's kind of like if you go into a courtroom, okay. I, can, I, I may have to say not guilty even if I'm not convinced of innocence, because the burden of proof is on the claim of guilt. And so the people who say, I have good evidential warrant to believe in the supernatural, have adopted a burden of proof, and they have to meet it. And until they do, I am not convinced. Okay, but let's, we'll come, let's be clear about what that burden of proof is, because I'm not saying I have definitive proof that God exists, or these are his attributes. Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying, I don't know if there is a God in the sense of no... I call myself a believer. Now, right away, we distinguish between a believer and a knower, right? Sure. It's, it's an important distinction. A belief. I believe there is a place called Papua New Guinea because I trust maps and I've studied about it. Uh, and uh, but I know my brother. I wouldn't say I believe I have a brother because I know the guy. So knowledge. Are you saying you don't know that there's a Papua New Guinea? No, I'm saying I'm saying I I I know it in the sense that I accept the authorities from which I learn about it. Sure. I, I trust it. Well, and if for, I for went clarity, there, it's not just relying on authorities; it's actual evidence. So you have a belief in a proposition, right? Whether or not it qualifies as knowledge is a separate question because knowledge is a subset of belief. In philosophy, it would be justified true belief. I tend to use a more kind of colloquial because I'm a dilettante. I'm an uneducated oaf who just talks a lot. But if you have a proposition and you accept that it's true, that's all I mean when I say I believe it. You either accept it or you don't. If I say I know it, all we generally mean, all most people mean when they say I know something, is that they really, 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 really believe it. They're talking about the confidence level that they have in that proposition, that it is likely true. And when we say I know something, generally we're saying... I believe this to the extent that it would be worldview altering to discover it was wrong. And so I believe there's a Papua New Guinea. I would actually argue that I know, I have evidential warrant that there's a Papua New Guinea without actually, without actually ever having been there. This is, you know, people used to do the, uh, oh, well, you, you don't know there's an Australia. Well, I do now because I've been there. But even before I was there, I think that I had evidentiary warrant for it. Uh, yeah, but... but Okay, I agree with that, I, and I know that there's a Papua Guinea in that sense. Let's sure. take a different example. If, let's say I were to tell you I'm from India. Okay. okay. You have no reason to doubt me. You probably believe I'm from India. Yeah. Now, you don't actually know that. It depends on what you mean by no. Well, and, and are you 100% sure? No. Do, is 100% certainty required for knowledge? Not necessarily, but I would, what's, I would what's your bar? I have, so I don't think you can be 100% certain about anything, okay. which is why I abandon the notion of certainty, which is why when I talk about knowledge... Um, I talk about it as a subset of belief and it is a confidence level. But also, I genuinely don't really, I, I'm unimpressed when someone says they know something because we don't wait till we have knowledge to act. We act in accordance with our beliefs and whether or not your belief rises to the no level of knowledge doesn't change what, you're gonna, what okay. your action is going to be. All right. So let's, let's, let's sort of circle back to where I was going okay. with the three big questions. And I think you... We started with death. Were in, right. You were in violent agreement that the... Cause, that right, that we don't know, the cause of the universe, you don't, we don't know any prescribed purpose for our lives. We try to discover it, but we don't know it. Um, and uh, we don't know what happens after death. Yeah, I'm, I'm not convinced that anything does, but I definitely well, uh, would agree, we don't know. Fair enough. Now, let me ask you this question. What do you do about belief when you are in exactly this position? When... If something is true, it would have tremendous implications. For example, you would concede that if there was life after death, that would greatly affect the way we think about life on Earth now. 
It, it would. Depending on what that life looked like. And depending on whether or not anything in this life had any impact on that life. Correct. But, yeah. but, but right. yes. So, so let's just say if the religious narratives are correct and there is some sort of cosmic justice in which, let's just say, the, the crimes that are the undiscovered crimes of this life have to be accounted for in a future life, we would probably have to start thinking about all the stuff that we get away with in private because even though we escape human accounting, there would be some sort of presumably divine accounting. So in other words, all I'm trying to establish is that there's a relevance to these questions even if we don't definitively know anything about them, anything about the answer. The answer matters which way we go. I, would, I agree the answer matters. It's just that the answer right now is I don't know, and you can play the what-if game for any one of them. What if there's nothing? What if it's the end? What if there's a being who's going to judge you based on whether or not you fell for things without sufficient evidence? What if so, that's the criteria? Okay, so what, you seem to, so what you seem to say is I think about something, and if I really can't answer the question, right, I take the default position that that something doesn't exist until evidence shows up that's going to convince me it does. Of course. That's, That's your view. That is sound epistemology that accepting... Sound epistemology according accepting, to whom? Uh, according oh, to you. Sure. Okay. Well, let's go according to me because I don't need to cite anybody else. Right. Because I'm right. Because... <laughs> the, okay, hold on, hold on. Let's, 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 let's see if you're right. You're, let's see if you're right. Uh, the alternative would be to, to say that I'm justified in believing something before there's sufficient evidence for it. But I would argue that you do that every day. Let me, let's give, me, give you a cardinal example. But, but that doesn't change the fact whether I should. You the should. I'm, I might, I'm saying you do We're all going to make mistakes. You, in you do and you should. Look, our life is always lived in anticipation of an unknown future, right? You're dating a woman. Yes. And, um, and so what you do is you, being a very reasonable guy, plug in all this data, mm -hmm. right, uh, about this woman, and you're trying to make a rational decision, let's say, is this the woman I want to spend my life with? Let's assume you're thinking about that question. For the sake of your argument, we'll assume I'm thinking about that. Okay. Now, I would argue that in reality, given the way human beings are, you could never really know what life with this person is going to be like, let's just say over the next 30 years. First of all, you'll be different people in 10 years, or different people in 30 years. So this question about what it's going to be like is unanswerable with any high degree of, of certainty, correct? Yeah, which is one of the reasons why I, unlike many religions, actually support the notion of divorce and, and I'm opposed to the notion that there's a soulmate out there that you're going to be everything to forever. If we're both in agreement that we don't know what the future holds, I don't make a decision but to say... But if you'll pardon me, that's, that's a tediously predictable response. I'm not going there. Where I'm going with, with well, is I the fact... Well, I didn't think you were going there. No, because... There. Right. Where I'm really going with is the fact that in making a decision of whether or not to be with this person, yes or no, mm -hmm. you are necessarily taking a huge leap of faith. No. 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 See, that's the thing. My, the way I operate my life, and maybe I'm a weirdo, is, so for example, in this case, I have no plans to end this relationship, and neither does she, but we are both adults, and we, as, and my, my one, there were two rules, be honest, have fun. That's it. That's all, be honest, enjoy life. And as long as we're both honest, we can reevaluate the nature of our relationship at any point, I am friends with every one of my exes, including my ex-wife, who I just spoke to. We went into it with this optimism that perhaps we would spend the rest of our lives together and with the realistic notion that it doesn't happen. Anybody who, th the divorce rate's 50 some odd percent, anybody who goes into a marriage now thinking, ah, oh, we're never gonna get divorced, is already in opposition with the actual data. And so I, as a huge proponent of David Hume, one of my favorite quotes for him, is that the wise man proportions his belief to the evidence. So my confidence in any proposition, including this particular relationship lasting until I die, is based on whatever data I have. I don't have some delusion uh, that some other people want to run around with. I, I've, I've found the person and we're definitely going to be together forever because life is uncertain. And it seems that rather than engaging in that self-deception, I'm fine saying, this is what I hope happens. I hope that I am with you for the rest of my life. I hope that or for the rest of our lives or whatever. But I don't have an unrealistic expectation. But don't you make plans? Sure, I make plans for tomorrow because that's the pragmatic... 
You don't you buy know, insurance, you don't build homes, you don't make plans, you don't, yeah. you don't put money into a 401k, and you don't, you don't put money into educational funds. Yes. You do. Right. So in other words... That's because I have a reasonable confidence based on data about how long I'm likely to live and what benefits are likely to be rewarded from there. Based it's on not an exercise so it, of faith. Let me ask you this. Because what it, you're talking about is confidence in the absence of certainty. But I'm, my confidence is proportional to the evidence. The fact that there isn't certainty about the future doesn't mean that it's an exercise of faith. I'm saying that the evidence you're invoking is bogus because according to you, if the divorce rate were 5%, you would make lifetime plans because according to you, there's a much higher chance, 95% probability. No, that's not remotely what I said. Well, I it would, is kind of I what you said. I would make lifetime plans because I hope to have a lifetime not because what the divorce rate is. Well, I, I know what the life expectancy is for people in the United States. For me, roughly, I can, I can make a rough guess as to barring some other consequences, how long I'm going to live. So, of course, I'm going to plan for the future. You plan for what you are optimistically hoping for. But I could get hit by a bus out here in New York where, by the way, the, no, it doesn't matter which direction you're walking down these streets, the wind is always in your face. <laughs> Sorry. That, is, that may be true. Look, um, I think life is lived in the moment. We look at memory as a reliable, although not very reliable, yeah. account of the past, but we trust it. Even though, again, if someone were to demand we substantiate that trust, we'd be a little hard-pressed to do it. it would be memory is very selective. Other people remember different things than you remember and so on. And life is, is, has an unknown future stretching in front of us. Now, at all times in history, people are in huge ignorance about the world, large parts of which in the past were completely unknown. If I was Socrates walking in, the, in Athens in the 5th century BC, and I looked up in the sky, I'd see seven stars, right? Now, if I was taking the rationalist position, I would say, well, I see seven stars. I have no reason to believe that there are any more stars in the sky, and... Hey, it, just for clarity, yes. are you saying this is remotely accurate or is this just an example? Because anybody who thinks that back then people only saw seven stars, I got problems with. No, fair enough, okay. fair enough. I, I'm, using, I'm using the okay. limited radius of our empirical knowledge. Just, I knew that. Just for your benefit, it's an analogy. Yeah, right. You and, and, you know, the, uh, yeah, so the ancients knew the earth is round and so on. But, but the, true, the point here is that you have this limited body of data. But if you really reflect on the data and you also reflect on yourself, right away you see, hey, I'm Socrates. I've never moved five miles away from the place I was born. I don't even know how big the Earth is. There could very well be a whole bunch of other stars out there, and just because I have not one ounce of empirical evidence for them, I can't be close to them or declare them out of bounds or declare that my whole life has to be lived without regard to that possibility. Well, because not, it's a very real possibility. So let's say you and I both lived on, on this particular plot of land in New York our entire lives, and we had only ever seen seven stars. Right. I'm not ruling out the possibility that there are other, seven other stars. I'm right. dealing with people who are saying there are more than seven stars, and they can provide no evidence for it. Right. But let's, let's just say that those people who say that there are more than seven stars, right, have the following type of reason for, those, for saying that. They say, first of all, let's just say that we're part of a natural universe, right? This is Kant's, the starry heavens above. And they also know that I can't see very far. So because I only see seven stars and I know that I can't even see a guy who walks over the horizon, I probably think there are a whole bunch of other stars that I just can't see because my eye only goes that far. Would that be an irrational reason to believe in more stars even though I only see seven? Yes. It would be irrational, according to so, you. So, while you can come up with that as a justification, the reason that it seems like, I'm, talk, I'm talking within your analogy. of Within my analogy. Ever, we've only ever seen seven stars. That is not, so we have deductive reasoning. And then we have inferences, which is basically where science operates. And then there's abductive reasons. And abductive is going to be the weakest. And abductive is going to be arguing towards a, the best explanation. And in that case, we need candidate explanations. What you're talking about is, is an inference that seems intuitive, but has no evidence to actually support it. It does. The fact, the fact that I can only see so far should should guide my brain to say, I should not be reaching conclusions about what is beyond my ability to see. 
Okay, so let's take, for example, you've seen a certain number of dogs in your life, correct? Yeah, tons of them. She okay. stops at every one. Right. Ab above and beyond that, you haven't seen other dogs that are outside the radius of your empirical experience, true? Correct. Y do you believe in that there are other dogs other than the ones you've seen? Uh, I have evidence of other dogs on Earth. If, it well, what was that evidence? I've seen video footage. I have. Okay, met but, there, but let's just say the video footage. Let's count those among the dogs you've seen. What about the dogs you haven't seen? Sure. You we believe have, they exist on Earth? Yes, but if you tell me that I should then then believe that there are dogs on Saturn, that's the level of thing we're talking about. No, here. it's not. It's not. Absolutely not. See, this is the heart of the matter. This is the heart of the matter, because according to you, religious people believe that there is a God, who, like in ancient. Greece inhabits the natural world that's living on another planet and so your reasoning is at the level of the cosmonauts who go up into the sky and go no God up here therefore God doesn't exist no that's not it well you just said that that I'm proclaiming a dog on Saturn yes and I'm saying I'm not, that's not what I'm doing at all so if I'm, I can only see seven stars there is a weak inference that there may be more stars but to believe there actually are more stars isn't yet justified by the evidence the dog example on earth even though I have not experienced every dog I can actually do pretty much a rough estimate of dog by searching through data on how much dog food we sell how many people buy Kong food things for their dogs, how many pets or us are scattered around the world. There's all sorts of data that get to this thing where now it is a strong inference that there is a dog in China that I have never met and will never meet. Do I believe that that's the case? Yes, because that's where the data point to. To, to go beyond what the data show, okay. to say that just because I've, I, I know that I have a limit to my vision and I can see seven stars, therefore I believe there are more, that is to go beyond what the data presents. You could, though, invent a telescope and improve your vision and get new data, which is exactly what we did to discover that we don't just live in the one and only galaxy and that the Earth isn't the center of the universe. Once we got that data, we began to have a better understanding of it. There are things, like the Higgs boson, for example, which are a part of theoretical physics that we didn't have physical, empirical evidence for, but that the math pointed to. I'm not in any way denying that math is good data, which is one of the reasons why, well, all right, I won't go there yet because we're still on Well, I mean, here we are on common ground. If you're talking about science, if you're talking about quantum physics, if you're talking about relativity, if you're talking about the Big Bang, if you're talking about evolution, we have nothing to argue about. I'm on board with you 100%. Hang on, you included science in that. Science, yes. I'm on board with... Does that include with, climate change science? Uh, climate change is... At least in the, in the public sense, it's understood in no way science. Okay. We'll probably get back to that after we're done. We can come back to that, but it's, it is in no way science. I, I'm I not a climate scientist. No. So it's, I mean, I, I am on board 100% with the science of the greenhouse effect. If you, when people say 97% of scientists, and you actually look at what 97% of scientists believe, they believe in the greenhouse effect. And the greenhouse effect is simply basically saying the release of carbon into the atmosphere warms the atmosphere. You'll get no disagreement from me on that. Now, there are several other propositions that are married to that, I think, s smuggled under the carpet. Things like human beings are the primary cause of these differences. Second of all, the best way to tackle them is to change, ultimately, the temperature of the Earth in various ways that we could, we could try to affect through human uh, so behavior. Your, your, your objection is, is and, and I, we'll get back to God like right after this, I, I, I don't... I don't know how far apart we are, and I have no expertise there, but it seems that your objection is primarily about how much are we the cause, what can we potentially do about it, what are the potential solutions, less so than what's happening. Well, I mean, look, yeah, normally if I walk out and it's really hot, there are two possibilities. One is I can try to change the outdoor temperature, right? The other is I can take off my jacket. Those are two ways to respond to the same phenomenon. Um, unless you're a polar bear. Unless you're a polar bear. Now... There's a woman who counts the number of polar bears on the Earth. And she has nothing to do with climate change. She did a report a couple of years ago saying there are more polar bears walking on the Earth than ever. The polar bear population has multiplied. Now, right away she finds herself in controversy. Why? Not because her counting is wrong. It's difficult to count polar bears, admittedly, but she's the best one doing it in the world. 
But the reason she's controversial is it's not supposed to be the case. The glaciers are supposed to be melting, the habitat's changing, the polar bears disappearing. So the very fact that there are all these polar bears thriving and running around is like a major embarrassment. And so you have to dump on her and attack her. As, but even though she's giving you a valuable piece of data, scientific data, that bears upon the truth of this hypothesis. The hypothesis sure. is that the Earth is getting hotter. Now think of it. The Earth is getting hotter by a degree or so Celsius over a hundred years. And this is measured by things, in effect, putting thermometers in the ocean, which depend upon how far the thermometers are from the coastline, what the level of the ocean is at the... And these measurements are then modeled, in other words, put into computer programs to generate conclusions which ultimately have ca massive implications for the world economy. So what I'm getting at is, there are people who are asking us to change our way of life because of a one degree move in the climate. Now, my, my view on climate change is this. I watch the people who say this to see how serious they are about it. The very people who There's say this. There's your mistake. Well, for example, I look at Mike Bloomberg. Mike Bloomberg owns, I believe, 11 homes. Can we stop looking at Mike Bloomberg? Because well, those ads are everywhere. Like, I got to Times <laughs> Square, and it's like right there. We couldn't, we, every time we turn around, Mike Bloomberg. But I'm anyway, just saying, here's a guy who says it's going to be a priority for him as president. And I would say, really, if you have 11 homes, shouldn't you go down to seven well, if you really thought that your carbon imprint is a little too big. I, I would completely agree with you there, but Mike's hypocrisy isn't really relevant to what the but data But are we talking about the hypocrisy of everybody? Because... No, I'm talking about what the data show. Okay, let's, here's the data. Everyone can see this data, mm -hmm. okay? Now, the Obamas, who are major apostles of this data, just bought a $12 million house right on the ocean, right on the water in Martha's Vineyard. Okay. These are the same people who are saying that in 12 years or 10 years, Miami will be engulfed by the ocean. The oceans are going to rise and swamp coastal properties, right? And my point is not just that the Obamas are hypocrites. That would be one small piece of data by itself. Here's my point. If the data is believed, if it's plausible, if it's even probable, if there's even a 50% chance that that would be the case, real estate properties worldwide on, on the coast would plummet and the inland would rise. But the fact that that's not happening anywhere to my knowledge tells me this. Real estate agents know it's bullshit. Buyers know it's bullshit. Sellers know it's bullshit. Everybody knows it's bullshit. Curiously, so, all those people have no scientific foundation to assess the data. Maybe, uh, wait, 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 maybe, hold, hold on, hold maybe on. those people no, 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 are buying on. those because they know we're screwed and they only got a few years left to spend their millions, might as well enjoy it on the coast. Really? That's what you think? It's, it's a, so, I'm wait, looking, me, I'm, when I'm evaluating this, and first of all, I have no, I definitely want to get back to the God thing. I'm not a climate scientist. I, I'm not going to pretend any expertise. And there are areas of this where you and I are still are going to be in agreement. But when I'm trying to figure out whether or not something is real, I'm looking at the science and what the experts have to say, and you're looking at whether or not the Obamas are hypocrites, or whether Bloomberg's a hypocrite. No, no, That no. is not a sound epistemology to determine out whether no. or not the climate is, okay. Well, a couple of things. First of all, the climate scientists are, and, and I think we, this is more true of this branch of science than it is generically true, they're highly interested observers of this phenomenon. Climate science is a massively funded enterprise. It gets gigantic dollars, and the gigantic dollars are aimed at finding a predetermined conclusion. I don't think you're innocent okay. of the idea that researchers get huge grants, take researchers who get huge grants from pharmaceutical companies. Take researchers Except who get, this, is, this is bull. This is bull. Yes, because now the, the bulk of the world has at least... Let's, let's assume that, it's, that the climate change stuff is BS. The bulk of the world is bought into it and is, are, are making efforts to change things, to change the way we live our lives, mostly so we can have a life. But now, wouldn't there be more money in the people who are actually going out to debunk this? This is, this is the sort of conspiracy level thinking oh, that people no, 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 raise no, no, about no, science no. all the time. Oh, the money is leading them towards this conclusion. There's money in anything that you can demonstrate to be true. This is why I don't buy into the big pharma conspiracy stuff of trying to keep us sick, et cetera. Okay. Because there's money in a cure. There's money in new diseases. There's money in this. There's money in that. There's money. There's no, wait, where's show, the money in debunking it? Let's say I have, an, I, I have charts right here, and I show you 
The whole thing is BS. Who's going to pay me? All those people buying coastal properties that you think are hypocrites. Why would they pay me? Because now, if you can demonstrate that it's BS, now their property values go up even more because now... That just means they'll give the money to the, to the real estate agents and to the buyers, but how are they going to fund me? How do I benefit? You're suggesting that people will fund people to do research towards a foregone conclusion that benefits them unless it's the foregone conclusion that benefits them that I mentioned. No, I'm saying, I'm saying that it, it's simple common sense that, that when there is a proposition that leads to certain... Climate change is a huge industry. I, it's a, it's a, so. It is a multi-billion dollar industry. You look like a, a guy like Al Gore. Al Gore's been a government servant his whole life. Do you realize Al Gore has a net worth of $200 million? How did he get $200 million? He, he got $200 million through climate change. Okay? It's a very profitable business. Okay. The debunkers of climate change are sitting in, a, in obscure research institutions collecting a $55,000 salary. Which I would argue is an ad hominem fallacy that says nothing about whether or not no, the data... It's, it's not. No, it's not ad hominem it fallacy. Is. It is. It's pointing to the fact that that research is not disinterested. That's not an ad hominem point. Al Gore's point. not doing research. The fact that he can profit off something is independent from what researchers are finding out. You don't get to shame researchers because they made some No, no, no. Money. But I'm saying the researchers profit in a huge way too. Look at, look at climate scientists and, and look, at the, look at the money okay. that goes into the... Re okay. Let's, I let's, will investigate how much clients okay. are climate But when you said, you said something else as well, which I think is, reflects a lack of understanding of markets, which is you said the real estate agents the stock market, the real estate appraisals, those people are not scientists, right? Those people may not be scientists, but they, see, they are in a, in a business where they put their money where their mouth is. Yes. Right? So, in, in other words, it's one thing for me to say, I'm running for president and the earth is getting hotter. It's another thing for me to say, you know what, I'm living in this house on the ocean, it's a million dollars, it's going to be worthless in 12 years, I should sell it to Dinesh for 100000 because it's literally going to be worth zero. The but fact that they don't necessarily believe that doesn't say anything. An individual's belief about what they think is going to happen with respect to climate change says nothing about what the data show with respect to climate change. You're talking about how convinced people are. You might as well be running around claiming and to get back to the God thing because we still got the supernatural and the afterlife and the origin of the universe. This argument is essentially the same as saying, look at how many believe, people believe it and how strongly they believe it and how, much, how some of them are willing to sacrifice their lives for this. That must mean it's true. No, that gets to what humans do or don't believe, which is why your objection about hypocrisy is one that I share. The fact that there may be hypocrites or maybe, maybe they're just looking at it and saying, hey, I got this money, I'll do this, we'll see what happens. Maybe the well, will change, maybe it won't. Here's the That's problem. That's all irrelevant to what the actual fact of the matter is with regard to climate change or God. Well, we, let's focus on climate change for a second. We'll turn to God in a moment. All I'm trying to say is that here is an issue that is, that is transporting itself into the domain of public policy. Mm -hmm. So it's not an issue of pure science. This is not like was Einstein right uh, in, in, in that E equals MC square, and we can send somebody to go look at an eclipse and verify, whether what, what I, or, or, or verify that Einstein's prediction was true. That's an argument in the domain of pure science. In the climate change argument, it's going to have to come into the public domain because we're asked to make decisions like don't use plastic straws and change. I, I agree. Right. And so, so, as, so, but now we've moved from what the data show about what is happening to what we should do about it. And there, I think there's plenty of room for disagreement, discussion, everything else. That's, that's where the disagreement's occurring. It, it's it, not occurring over... If you're telling me that the Earth has warmed by one degree over the last hundred years, I grant that to you. I say, what have you really shown me so far? Very little. Very little. Sure. Okay. But neither of us are climate scientists. Exactly. And or, fair or enough. And, and you're, you'll be right. You'll be, you'll, and these are the same, by the way, these are the same climate market. scientists who told us, the same climate scientists who told us in the 70s and 80s that the earth was really? cooling. Really? Yes. The same guys in the 70s? Well, I mean, it's... Are, are they like 84 now? And well, like, okay, fair enough. All right. Fair enough. So... So you're telling me now that even though we're measuring the same duration, i.e. not 1980 to now, but let's just take, for example, the, the Earth from 1900 to 1980. You're telling me that there's a whole group of scientists at top universities. There's a book by Lowell Ponty in the 70s called The Cooling. 
All the apocalyptic rhetoric of today is duplicated in that book with the sole exception that the earth is cooling. It's not getting hotter, it's getting colder. Global cooling. In fact, I think this is the root of the substitutionary phrase climate change because the climate somewhere in some way is always changing. But the point is this, that all these measurements from 1980 going back to previous 80 years show a cooling trend. So you're telling me that they were wrong and the new guys I'm coming in. I'm not telling in, you anything. Well, I'm just saying that you know, you're accepting now that a new bunch of guys will come in measuring the same phenomenon Right? Maybe using better instruments. And, That's and it's, how science gets better, yeah. Yes, but it gets better by and large by greater precision. Do you Not think, by basically saying that, that up we, is down and down is up. Sure, but if you find, so th there's, and, and I have no specific expertise, hey, fine, uh, in this particular. What, the thing is, this is the science got it wrong before, so it likely has it wrong again, which is a fallacy in and itself. Because the fact that the only thing in the entire... Uh, in let's, the enti let's probe that fallacy. Why is it a fallacy? Because the past doesn't necessitate the future. Right. And the fact that something we discovered that science was wrong about something is, doesn't mean that our new discovery is wrong or as likely to be wrong or anything in the neighborhood. Science is the single most consistently reliable method for accurately understanding the world. The natural world. And the only thing that has ever come along to correct a flawed finding in science is more and better science, not religion, not hypocrisy, not what's well, the wait market a but, doing. But, but that's silly because that's, okay, that would, be, that would be like me saying, science is greater than philosophy because scientific findings are cumulative and they have gotten more precise and accurate about the natural world, whereas in philosophy, we haven't advanced all that far past Plato. Okay, I'll buy that. You'll buy that? So, philosophy, which I love. I'm a philosophy geek, especially okay. when it comes to epistemology. Um, so, philo But I don't think we've... What have we done on epistemology since... Oh, I'll just stick with Hume. When you, once you have the foundations of thought, there's not much left to explore there. Once you have identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle, once you have the foundations of a syllogism, once you have the foundations of set theory and Venn diagram, and you've got your epistemology, now that's when science can say, ah, now we can tell when we're, when we're justified in accepting something and when we're not, and to what extent. And so the science then does this inferential testing to build a model that is our best example of the universe, and it is tentative and subject to revision. That's, that's what science, science doesn't make proclamations about truth. Yeah, but it, I, I think it, you're... But scientists do. So if there's a climate scientist out there that says, the truth is this, that's not science. That's preaching on behalf of science. What they should be saying is the data show this, here's the model, this is the extrapolation of this model, this is our best understanding and best estimate for what's going to happen in the future. So that they're making decisions like I am about my future based on actual data and not, and, and what we, you know, and not just what we hope happens. Well, I think it was Wittgenstein who said that when, even if all possible scientific questions could be solved, the most important human questions would still be on the table. Now, the, the importance of that is this. I think you're, you're awarding a sort of prize to science based upon a stacked deck. You're, de you're defining scientific truth as somehow superior, and you're declaring that on that basis, arguing inside the bubble of science, science comes out first prize. But, and according to you, philosophy, because it's dealing with enduring human, you may say, eternal questions like what is good, uh, what is right, uh, how do you tell right from wrong, uh, not to mention questions like how do we know what we know, um, That's uh, the one is, I went with. Uh, yeah, with the or, or, to, or to pursue, here's Immanuel Kant. You asked who went past Hume. I would say Kant did. Um, you ask questions like, when I look at, at um, something in space, okay. is the space in the world or is the space a mode of my perception? Is time something out there in the world? Just think about it. Time is this thing, this object, with no weight, no... Time isn't an object. Well... T uh, Time it, is an abstraction. Is an abstraction. And abstractions, by and large, live in our mind. 
Yes. So Kant's point is that space and time are dimensions of the... They are, they are things that the mind brings to experience. They are not something out there in the world. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying they're, to resolve that issue. Okay, I, I don't think either of us is going to top Kant on this one in the next oh, I 30 seconds. Uh, 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 you, all I'm trying to say is that to argue that this kind of a question is somehow either settled or unimportant because because there is no way of sort of addressing it in a scientific sense, I think reflects a certain narrowness of perspective about the wide range of human knowledge, the wide range of disciplines, and from history to psychology. I said anything remotely like that, but I didn't. Well, you gave a little kind of science comes first, and I, that's what I was responding to. Science is to. the most consistently reliable method of accurately understanding the universe. The, the cosmos, not the, 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 well, the natural not, not world. The natural world, perfect, exact. But we live in a world where, not a, we are in a natural world to be sure, right? But we are anomalous objects in that natural world, right? First of all, we are conscious of our own existence. We are conscious that here we are in the world observing the world. Okay. That makes us different from most of the world, true? Yeah, Okay. as far uh, as I can tell. Yeah, and as far as we can tell, even in the living world and in the animal kingdom, we are anomalous in that we not only have consciousness, but we have self-consciousness. True? Some of us. Okay. Um, okay, and to push it further, coming back a little bit to Kant here as well, Kant says, I am, I'm amazed by the starry heavens, and, and then I'm equally amazed by the moral law within me. So now we come to another thing which is worth mentioning, which is, well, Adam Smith's phrase for it was the impartial spectator which is, to, to quote Adam Smith, there is this man within the breast, sort of another guy, he, as Smith envisioned him, inside of us that is clearly not us because this guy, let's call him a guy, is a bit of a nuisance. This guy... How did we reach the conclusion that it's not us? First of all, I'm not, I'm not going to here, here, here's that there's why. a man in here or that he's not me. Well, no, but, but, but I, all, the only point I'm trying to make in a roundabout way is that... As humans, we are inherently moral beings. Uh, morality is part of the equipment of being human, and in fact, it's, it's a necessary part. In our criminal law, for example, if somebody is considered not to know the difference between right and wrong, we don't even hold them accountable for their actions. Which is to say, we consider That's morality... That's not true. That's not true? Yeah. If somebody, let's say, for example, some guy is so insane that he thinks he's Napoleon and he goes out and kills somebody else. We still hold them responsible for their actions. We just have graduated to a point where we are killing fewer people who are of diminished mental capacity, thankfully, well, uh, but we are also committing people to institutions for their own benefits. But it's not like you just walk in and say, ah, blameless. Well, I, I, John Hinckley was in an institution for shooting the president of the United States, yeah. and he's out. Uh, so he was. Is he better? Has he shot anybody else? Uh, he hasn't shot anybody else. But but my point is, he was held not responsible for that act in a criminal sense. That is that is a, a technical definition within the law. He was still held responsible. No no no. We, okay, we, but like we let them get away with. I'm it. not saying that. What I'm saying is, if somebody has no moral comprehension whatsoever, we basically call them a psychopath or a sociopath. And all I'm trying to say is that that's a way of saying that you are outside the human community because the normal moral equipment that the rest of us have that comes into play... So, uh, just for clarity, you're suggesting that those individuals, and, and I, I would stay away from diagnostic terms normally, but, but psychopaths, sociopaths, they don't have that inner man that... I'm saying if society makes a determination that, that someone is in a sense, a psychopath or a sociopath, they are considered, in a sense, outside the normal moral community of human beings, not accountable to the same... But, the, but no, but I'm, so for clarity, we start off with this, we all have this, and now we've identified a group of people who don't have it. And, and, and I'm saying that those people who don't have it, or at least have somehow... I'm not saying they weren't born with it. I'm saying I agree. I do think that our moral equipment, like our other equipment, can be damaged. It can be destroyed. It can be squelched. It can be brutalized. So, yeah, let's assume that there's somebody who's gone through whatever experiences that have caused them to be morally anesthetized. Okay. And so, for example, they could bring in a little dog right here and joyfully stomp on it as oh, the audience no, gasps in horror. Um, um, or if you want a more mixed reaction, a cat... The point I'm trying to make, however, is Sorry, that... Sorry, Beth. 
the point I'm trying to make is just this, that, that we in, in try to understand the cosmos. We don't just understand the, the physical world, which is the domain of science, I agree. Sure. But I'm saying we have to, dis, we have to understand ourselves. I, I, I couldn't agree more that we should understand ourselves, and I think that one of the biggest problems is that there are a number of assumptions. That, the biggest problem humans make is probably asking the wrong questions, like, what's the purpose of my life? As if it was externally imposed and extant as a real thing that you could discover, rather than I make my own meaning and purpose in life. But we're talking about this moral being. I would presume. Wait, wait. I mean, you, you just made a, an absolutely ridiculous statement. So I, oh, good. I, I have to stop, pause a little bit here because I'm sort of. That's fine. Grasping you make this. a ridiculous statement. And, well, and according I'll be able to you, do the same thing. Yeah. According to you, we don't have a life purpose. I mean, let's think about it. First of all, almost all of us are, in some sense, trying to discover what the purpose of our life is, right? And there are huge industries devoted to this. There are talk shows devoted to this. There's a, oh, so the, the, it's a quest that just about all of us, probably most of us in the audience, are on, and you're declaring at the outset that it's a, it's, it is a quest, according to you, that has no answer, or at least has no external answer? No, I, I, it is a quest that I don't see any reason to think that there is an externally imposed purpose. The fact that you might desire there to be the, a, a God, a divine, or a universe-imposed purpose doesn't mean there is one. The fact that humans quest for things doesn't mean that the answer is there, or doesn't mean that the answer they hope for is there. Of course not. So we're not, no one is saying that the, the wish to have a purpose is enough. No, I'm not even saying that the universe is somehow... What is our purpose? Well, I, I would say this, that, that I think in life, we are always asking this question. Um, um, am I, Dinesh, living the best life that I can live? In other words, is the life I'm living now somehow off track? inauthentic is there when i when i say something is there there's me saying it but is there a better me that would have said something different in other words i agree okay so in other words the, my quest to find not only the choices i make but the choices i ought to make is completely valid true so th there's a contextual thing this is where we got with the 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 labels and how we end up looking at this yeah um I'm, my view is that my life has whatever meaning and purpose I give it. Okay. The notion that I should be looking for some externally imposed purpose is not only, not only do I not, not have a good reason to think that there is such a purpose or that there would be or could be. And you're saying, but whatever answer you give to that question of what is, let's take, what is the purpose of Matt's life? And you're saying, whatever answer you give is valid. Yes. Because if, in fact, there is some God who has a purpose for my life, I don't care what his, he thinks my, the purpose of my life should be. My life is mine. Okay, let's, let's explore that. Let's just say that you were to come here and announce to this audience, the purpose of my life, Matt, is to, and I realize this is a difficult example, I was going to say to count the hairs on my head. This doesn't really work in your case. There, there uh, are hairs here on my head. This, right, there you go. This my head. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Okay, but you said, that's what I live for. Every day I wake up and I spend a few hours a day, at least at the time I'm not working or eating, counting the hairs on my beard. Yeah. Right? Now, I would submit that everybody here would say, Matt, you know what? I don't think you're living your best life, pal. You know? There's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but it's kind of pointless. Can you, can you show that, that this isn't the purpose of my life? That there is some other purpose? Well... Uh, yes, I would. I mean, I, I, think I, I, th I think I could make arguments to that effect. Okay. Let's pursue the example even further, make it more ridiculous so we can see how obvious it is. Let's just say, for example, and you know, I'm, I don't mean to be going into the trans territory, but I'm, I'm going to go there a little bit. Let's say I were to say, I identify as a toad. Okay. Okay? And so what I do is I get up in the morning and I start jumping around like a toad. Um, and for a while, people go, hey, that guy's an eccentric, man. What the hell is he doing? And then I go, listen, it's not just up to me. I'm getting a little annoyed that there are all these haters out there who don't respect my identity as a toad. Disney won't cast me in toad races in their movies. I don't get, I, I'm denied rights under the Constitution. 
uh, all these people look down on me and make jokes when I come, you know, jumping by, okay? So, and my point is not that I've decided to become a toad. My point is I've always been a toad. I'm just a toad in a human body. Okay, now, and I seriously press this. You would come to me, I think, and say, Dinesh, you know, you are a member of Homo sapiens. You're not actually a toad. This purpose of your life that you have ascribed to yourself is based on some deep psychological disorders. You have very poor self-perception of who you are as a human being. And who you are as a human being is you're a son, you're a brother, you're a graduate of an Ivy League college, and you uh, make movies. You know, go do those things and find a better, a higher purpose in life than jumping around in a dirty pond. You think that's what I would come to you and say? I hope so. <laughs> Unless you... Uh, I hope so. You may... Uh, no. You, you, might come, you might come join me. Because <laughs> first of all, I'm not a busybody who worries about what other people do and how they feel and what their views no, that's are. Not, it's not but also, uh, but that, that's not But also, I try to avoid fallacious arguments. And in fact, you Where's are a homo sapien, but homo sapiens include multiple different genders. And, even, and the fact that someone's gender identity doesn't match what you think it should be is none of your damn business. Well, hold on, hold on. Okay. So, right up to this point, you've been invoking science, right? Yeah. And suddenly, science is trumped by psychology. No. Yes, yes. No. Yes, because according to you, now your gender is not something, it's not a fact in the natural world. Even Correct. Though, yeah. Your gender... Your genetic sex and what your chromosomes are, those are facts, but your gender is a social construct... <laughs> This, really? this is the difference between, let's okay. say, someone who's genetically male and someone who's genetically female. Okay. Someone who has XX or XY chromosomes. And by the way, there are more than two of those because there's all sorts of chromosomal abnormalities. There are intersex people. The number of people who are born intersexed every year would shock most people because they just don't think that this sort of thing happens. However, that is about what your chromosomes are, what genetic predisposition you have, but it doesn't talk about what your state of mind is, what sort of self-perception you have. And so in addition to genetic sex, we also have uh, gender, which is, falls, actually falls into a number of different categories. So my apologies to all of my trans friends for the things that I'm about to get slightly wrong. There's a difference between gender identity and gender expression. And that was, the gender identity is the gender that you associate with but these, the reason I say these are social constructs is because what is a man? What makes a man a manly man? Well, you have the machismo aspect of the, the, the brawny and blah, but is someone who is weaker and more effeminate somehow less of a man? These, this is why this is a social construct, because it has to do with what roles we as a society put on it, which is why 150 years ago, pink was for boys and blue was for girls, and now it has reversed, although I would go with black for everybody. But the thing is, at the end of the day, what I would say to you, if you were hopping around like a frog, is I would ask you how you're doing. I would ask you how you feel. And if you're able to communicate to me that you identify as a frog, I'm not going to be running around saying, oh my gosh, let me fix this. It's when there's a demonstration that what you're doing may be something that society should care about, that, it, that is going to result in some sort of self-harm or a problem for your life. In, in, in other words, I'm okay with living and let living, but as long as my trans friends are committing suicide at an inordinate rate and are being murdered left and right because there are bigots who think that whatever your chromosomes are or whatever particular genitalia you might have dangling is the one thing that matters. As long as my, uh, a friend of mine in, Port well, not an actual friend of mine, but someone in, in Puerto Rico the other night was murdered for using the bathroom that they associate with when bathrooms are for peeing and pooping and hopefully washing your hands when you're done, what people are doing to try to suggest that you can't be who you are is absolutely repugnant, and it is busybody. There's nothing anti-science about this. 
It is psychology. And even if we were to say, and I'm not saying this, so before, I'm, I'm saying this because this comes up. Even if you were to say, this is all gender dysphoria and it's mental illness and these people aren't what they think they are, what science has to say so far, based on what we've explored and discovered within these individuals, is that being supportive, encouraging, and allowing them to transition is the single best path to them living the life they want to live and surviving. And until that changes, I will absolutely support what the data show is the best way to encourage trans people. So what I think you've done here is change the topic. The topic was... I'm pretty sure you said trans before I did. I, 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 did, I did, but I, I did by, by analogy. The point I was trying to make was, is there such a thing as male and female? Right? Really? Is that the point you were trying to make? Because it, it was, because, because... Because we got what to you this did was else. you took the category of male, which actually is a scientific category. It has a, it's like life is a scientific category. I made a category. distinction between male, female, and man, woman. Right. And then what you did is you introduced a new concept, which I wasn't introducing, of manliness. And I agree, manliness, which is to say the cultural accouterment of being a man, let's just say, for example, smoking a cigar or growing a mustache and, and hanging out at a club, that is manliness. And I agree that that is a social construct. I would argue it's a social construct by and large in accordance with nature because culture and society develops in congruence with a given human creature. Okay, Nobody's so... Nobody's suggesting that the roles no, don't no, no. have a, a, a historical perspective. I mean... Not historical, biological. Well, H sure. Gender's not a historical concept, it's a biological concept. When I say historical, I was not denying biology. I'm saying that because of certain biological things, it sets up norms of these are the hunter-gatherers, these are the ones that are going to go out and kill, these are the ones that are nursing the children, et cetera else. Those, those norms are constructs of our head. There's nothing wrong with a stay-at-home dad. There's nothing wrong of course with not. a woman working. There's nothing wrong with a woman earning as much as a man makes for doing not. the same work. Let's look at what we are arguing about. Okay. So in the civil rights laws of the 1960s, we had the principle of colorblindness, which is to say equal rights under the law. The law, let's say, should not pay attention to race. I realize this is complex with affirmative act. Let's leave it aside. Let's just say that the basic principle of, of, of the civil rights laws is that race is the painted face. I think that was Morris Dees' phrase from the 60s. And therefore, the law should not take it into account. That was the general norm. Now, right away, when, when sex was added to race in the Civil Rights Act, there was a bit of a problem, which is to say that men and women are very different, particularly in certain areas, on average. They're not different in every individual case. So, for example, men are stronger than women. Men are taller than women. Now, you can't refute that by saying, well, here's Sally, she's 6'3", and here's Fred, he's 5'4". I because, understand. Right. We're talking because about... we're talking about in general. Yeah. But, norms. but, the, but the, the normative conclusion from that simple biological fact is we established something that was abhorrent in the area of race. Let's call it separate but equal. Separate but equal was the hated doctrine of segregation, right? Yeah. Different water fountains. But we have separate but equal, for example, in men's and women's sports. In Wimbledon, the men play the men, the women play the women. We did that because we recognize that gender is not the same as race. Gender is not the painted face. Men are, in fact, stronger than women, and they can hit the ball harder on the tennis court, and therefore, Martina Navratilova gets to play Chris Evert, and Pete Sampras gets to play Andre Agassi. So our laws, our norms, are based upon this biological, irreducible fact. The norms are a social construct, but they're a social construct, you may say, in obedience to biology. Now, what you're saying is, I take it, that Pete Sampras, or take it, uh, uh, Pete Sampras can say, well, I came in, you know, I was the runner-up in Wimbledon. Next year, I'm going to enter the women's division, because I identify as a woman. This because after all, hard. hold on, gender is a social construct. This and is I, this is ridiculous? 
This is going on all over the country right now. Uh, your example is ridiculous. Is, why is it ridiculous? First of all, it, it's sports, and sports ball is ridiculous. But um, what? No, I'm, I'm sorry. That was a joke for somebody else. Okay. My sincere apologies, because I should be. I'm, I'm not I'm a devotee of sports, but I'm not. This isn't I'm about saying. what the law is. My view on sports, by the way, and many sports organizations have already dealt with this sort of thing, dealing with individuals who are transitioning and studying the science of it of various hormonal levels and things like that. And we're still in the, in the fledgling process of getting this sorted. I think that there shouldn't be any uh, gender restrictions on something. If somebody, what, uh, th 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 we should just have, these are the categories, like a tier A, tier B, tier C, tier D, and you compete at whatever level you can compete at. That way, people who are, whether they're women, men, or neither, whether they're, you know, whatever their identity is, they compete at this level. I am a big fan, uh, I, I play a lot of pool and snooker. And the fact of the matter is, if you look at the statistics over history, uh, generally speaking, in that particular discipline, women can't compete as well as the men. That's just what the data show from the past. However, there should be no reason why anyone, whether they are a woman under your criteria or a woman under their own, shouldn't be able to compete against anybody else they want if they can play at that level. And so I don't care for gender divisions along sports. I think sports, because it's a physical test, should be divided up on physical characteristics, irrespective of what gender somebody identifies with or expresses with. To go to the sports thing, the reason I, I say it's ridiculous is, yeah, we're working out these things, but the world doesn't turn, well, all right, sports makes a lot of money, no denying that. We're talking about the law and how it treats people, and we're also talking about human beings and how we treat people. Right. So if you saw me walk into a women's bathroom, what would your reaction be? It's clearly, we're at a restaurant, it's marked women's, and I walk in. What's your take on that? Well, I don't know what my take on it. I can give you my wife's take on it. Well, you would feel very uncomfortable if you sprang your testicles in a women's bathroom, as would most of the other women in that bathroom. If I sprang my testicles? Yeah. They, most women, I think, Aren't would you be, assuming I have testicles? I realize that may be a conjecture. Um, but, but the more important point is most women would be freaked out if a man walked into the women's bathroom while they were there. Okay. That's a fact. The thing is, there's a lot of factors that are missing from, from that example, which is, not, not the least of which, is, which my reason is. But do we have any evidence to show that anybody is in danger when a trans person goes into the bathroom that matches their gender identity to use it? Do we have any, any examples or data anywhere that somebody is more at danger? Do we have any evidence that trans people who would use their own biological bathroom are being psychologically harmed by doing that? Where is the evidence for that? So the evidence for that, the evidence for that is in the depression rate and suicide rate of people who are being emotionally harmed well, by not hold being on right able here. to identify. Stop right there. That's not... Okay, this is what I call arguing inside your own bubble. Inside your own bubble, somebody who is biologically male but thinks they're female, right, ha are not having any kind of inner clash, no inner trauma between physical and psychological realities, let's call them. They are not depressed or traumatized by the very fact that their own body does not agree with them, right? Rather, they're just traumatized by the fact that, when, that they have to go into a men's bathroom. I would argue that, that if there are higher rates of depression suffered by trans people, a lot of it might have to do with being trans, not being in that particular. No, a lot of it might have to do. So I asked for you example. Need studies no, that I, need to, those I two want things. examples of who's in danger when somebody uses the bathroom associated with their gender, because forcing them to use the other bathroom. And you know, you know when a when a when a trans woman walks into a woman's bathroom, you know who's in danger? The trans woman. They're the ones that are being killed. They're the, the one in Puerto Rico that was shot just the other day for going into that bathroom. They're the ones that are in danger for doing that from big. Well, I don't, I don't want to go down this road only because... How many... How many only but, because... But, no, no, no. Well, what's to stop me? Whether I identify as a woman, where I'm... First of all, if I was dressed as a woman, you wouldn't even know. 
What, you don't know what my junk is if I go in and open the door and sit down and use it? You don't have no idea. And it shouldn't be anybody's business what's in my pants or what I'm wearing. Well, the, quite, the, quite the, honestly, we, if what can you say is gender true, from the bathrooms entirely, if what you me. say is true that people don't know, you wouldn't even need laws, because this would be this is sort of like the saying, laws don't do anything to help. There's no. nothing stopping me from walking into a woman's you bathroom and assaulting but someone. But see, I, I think I think what you're missing here is this. You know, you're usually when you see a fence. In this case, the fence is the distinction between men's and women's bathrooms, right? And I, maybe we're overplaying this topic, but what I'm getting at is, if you want to take a fence down, always ask, why was that fence put up in the first place? Who did it, and why? Not if it's my property. I don't care why they put a fence up. Fair enough. But, but, but the point I'm making here is that we have men's and women's public bathrooms for a reason. And the reason, by and large, is... I would say, mostly for the protection of women. It's not that men... Yeah, trans women are women. Okay, but I'm not... Look, what I'm getting at is the, the, the sexual... We could have 21 types of bathrooms for 21 genders. We, we don't. We could just have one. Because you can all pee next to me. I don't care. Yeah. So what you're basically saying is that, is that the distinctions that we make between men and women in our society are culturally, according to you, arbitrary. According to you, for example, take no. tennis. Let's just, I'm just using sports because we're arbitrary. familiar with it. That's, okay. You say people should play at their own level, and therefore, if the top 100 tennis players are all men, that's, that's it doesn't it bother you the slightest. Basically, the conclusion is men are better than women in tennis. Although, what we would say is maybe the top 100 uh, tennis players all have this particular chromosomal makeup, whether they identify as men or women. Yes, I, 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 I see where you're going. Okay. Hey, guys. If you saw it 20 uh, minutes ago, we could have talked about God some more. But let's take no, it's funny. five more minutes and then... Uh, sure, so we're, we're not going to get to Trump. Let's spend five minutes on the future of America and take questions. Sounds good. What do you want for the future of America? <laughs> I'm going to... I'll softball it because... It, it, can um, we, it, maybe... And, and this is legitimately I don't know, and I, I'm interested... I am a staunch proponent of the separation of church and state, the separation of religion and government, as my, my friend would call it. I have no idea. You might completely agree with me. The, you're a staunch proponent of the separation of religion and government. Right. Um, I would agree to a point. It would depend on what we mean by this. So let's take examples. Sure. Um, do I think that a um, religious hospital that receives government funds should be forced to do an abortion? No. Uh, do I think that a, um, um, a person of religious convictions has to somehow pocket their religious convictions before stepping in the public square? No. Do I think that Amy Coney Barrett should be disqualified from being, replacing Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the Supreme Court because she's a devout Catholic? No. So, I agree with parts of most of those. Okay, so let's point to an area where we might disagree. Where is that wall being breached where you think I'd fall on one side of the divide and you on the other? So, so for, one, for example, I don't think anybody has to check their religion at the door when they become a, a public servant. However, if they legislate on behalf of a particular religion showing favoritism towards one over another or a religion over irreligion, that is a huge problem. Agree completely. Okay. Now, when it comes to, for example, uh, I love the way you phrased it, a, a religious hospital being forced to perform well, an abortion. St. Luke's or, you know, sure. Catholic hospitals. The, the big problem here is that hospitals, from my perspective, should be secular. I love the fact, I mean, the only reason that we have religious hospitals and religious universities is because the monumental religious privilege a privilege that religions have, have endured and, and benefited from throughout history. They're tax-free institutions, they have people donating money to them, and fine, I, I, I have no problem with people doing good, build a hospital, build a university, but if you're gonna build a hospital that's going to service an entire community, then the, the hospital services need to be medically sound and not based on religious doctrine or dogma. Well, the services of these hospitals are medically sound. What we're talking about is something that they agree, 
But not hos- all hospitals do They're everything. Not. Hold on, hold on. There are children's hospitals that don't take adults. I get it. That, right. There are cancer hospitals that don't take diabetes patients. Sure. If a Catholic hospital were to say, listen, we provide the full ensemble of, uh, of medical services, we just don't do abortion, they are acting in line with their conscience. This is not to say that abortion is not available in so the clinic the across the street. The fact why, would you, the fact why would somebody who believes in freedom want to force somebody to act against their conscience? Because Would you like it if I did that Because I don't care if, about your conscience if it's affecting whether or not somebody else can live. It, well, it's not affecting whether someone else can live because that guy can go no, across no, no. the street. If we have a Jehovah's Witness hospital that refuses to perform blood transfusions, is that okay? Well, it's okay if you want to go there. I wouldn't go there. I wouldn't either. Right. And that's awesome. And let's just I, say that the only people no, who I'm, go there are I'm, Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm thrilled that we're in both. So you want to force them now there. to do blood transfusions? No, I'm saying okay. that you don't always have a choice about what hospital you go to or what medical services you go to. Okay. This is one of the reasons why we have government and government interaction and government oversight, because if my only medical provider within any reasonable driving distance of me will not provide that, what do I do? This is why the, the better example is the conscience uh, of the pharmacist. Because first of all, a Catholic hospital, maybe a hospital that was built by Catholics, that was built with Catholic donations, that was built from Catholic donors, but not every doctor there is a Catholic, not every nurse there is a Catholic, not every patient there is a Catholic, so why should they all have to adhere to Catholic doctrine just because they built the hospital? Instead, the government should say, if you want to build a hospital, it needs to provide these services irrespective of your religion, and if your religion can't, can't accommodate that, then you don't get to build a hospital. I think, I think here you're, you're disrespecting a distinction between the public and the private sphere. In, all, in every other domain of life, we have private sector institutions, educational yeah. institutions, uh, uh, social work institutions, and those institutions develop policies based upon their mission and their conscience. They and decide, I'm fine with that as long as they don't give government funding. But oh, as soon as they do, as soon as they now do. it becomes something that is in the public interest. Okay, so let's take Planned Parenthood, okay. right? Planned Parenthood is... With, is, with is one a, minute left um, regarding yeah. Unplanned Parenthood. Well, okay. I was going to say, before you guys touch that, Let, yeah, um, it'll come why up. don't we do a little bit of a vote? Do you guys, and just use your voice, we'll do voting for either to keep the conversation going for the rest of the night or to move to Q&A. So let's go uh, Q&A. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, and, and then if we do keep the conversation rolling, we'll go into Trump. So conversation yeah. rolling. Okay, well, let's, let, let's do that. How much time have we got left? We got about a half hour. All right. I, we should transition so into Trump. Be careful, because he's promising Trump, and we started with God, and we didn't even finish that. And you had three things for God. I'm not even sure we finished one of them. I think we're going to need a couple more okay. nights so with you guys, you, to be you honest. Wanted, you wanted to go to, to well, Planned Parenthood. Let me, since you mentioned God, let me kind of make, make a point about that, because I think, I think that's where my three points were going. Okay. Um, Let's take, a, let's take the question I ended with. Is there life after death? I have no idea. You have no idea? Do and you neither, know? And neither do I. Cool. Of course not. Um, but here's my point. Uh, if I say I believe in life after death, you would say, that's an irrational position, Dinesh. Because no, I would say, what's the evidence for it? What's the evidence for it? And I would say, I don't have any evidence for it, and neither do you, but... <laughs> but I'm not believing it. Right. But... It is, and this is the key point, it is in the nature of the subject that no empirical evidence could settle the question because death is the termination of experience. And therefore, for you to demand evidence in a domain where evidence is unavailable is the height of foolishness. So when you say death is the termination of experience, it sounds like you're arguing that there is no after death. I'm arguing that our natural life I mean, I think the religious believer is fully on board with this, is complete, our natural life in this world will completely, irrevocably come to an end with death. And so in the empirical world that we live in, yes, there is not going to be evidence, nor will there be evidence in the future, that settles the question of what happens after natural experience ends. And the question about whether there is any 
you know, let's, let's remove the Christian context. Look at the Hindu context. The Hindu context is that there's a life after death, right? It's a natural life, but it's not in this domain. There's a world behind the world, and that, that natural life will occur there. But we have no access to it because we live in the empirical world that is, according to Hinduism, something of an illusion. Leaving aside the doctrinal parts of it, all I'm getting at is this. Here's a point where you are demanding that I settle the issue on the basis of an empirical evidence that is never forthcoming, and yet you agreed with me at the beginning, this is one of the questions that all intelligent people think about. It's relevant to their life because the answer to it, even if we don't know it, determines how we should live today. And all I'm trying to get you to admit is that since you don't know any more than I did, than I do, it is the same leap of faith that I'm taking to say that there is, that you're taking to say that there isn't, because you don't have one ounce of evidence any more than I do, That's one way or the other. That, give me a round of applause. That's outstanding. Because after an hour and so of sitting here and having explained this over and over again, you managed to get my position exactly, exactly wrong. Because I'm not, I'm not asking you to settle it. Do you believe in life after death? I do not believe that there is life after death. Perfect. So your, no, your position... Hang I, on. Okay. That does not mean... That is not the same as I believe there is no life after death. I'm saying, as you... We both sat here and said we don't know what's... What, okay, what and I'm saying... I, I'm and say you're saying I believe there's something afterwards. Okay, but you're missing my point. And I'm I, saying I is, don't believe that. Right, and I'm saying I do, and my position is not in any iota less rational than yours. Yes, it absolutely no, is, because no. you are accepting something and acknowledging that you have no evidence for it, and I am not accepting that something because there is no evidence. We agree there's no evidence, and you are saying you are rational to accept it despite the absence of evidence, and I'm saying you're not, which is why I don't accept it. But... To demand evidence, in the, in the opening page of the Critique of Pure Reason, Kant says, many of us profess to be apostles of reason, but never once do we step back and ask this question, what is it that reason can actually know? In other words, we live in a world where reason has the ability to arbitrate certain questions, and on other questions, reason is, in a sense, completely deaf. It has nothing to say at all. And you admitted, for example, that if you were a Greek in the 5th century BC, your reason, in the empirical sense, would have nothing to say about the world beyond the observational world. Your reason is, in a sense, silent. I have to go to the 5th century. Okay, or today. But, but here's my point. I accept whatever the data show, and I cannot go beyond that and claim that I'm reasonable. Okay, I can go beyond it. You clearly have. But I don't get to claim that I'm reasonable by saying, you and I have no evidence of what happens tomorrow, but I believe this. Okay, well, let's take, let's take, an, let's take a secular example to test this proposition. Okay. I take two guys, let's just call them A and B, you and me, and let's just say that I say, I believe that there is life on other planets. Okay. You say, to match this, I don't. No. Right? That's... You say... What do I say? I don't know. What's the evidence you, you to say, support your belief? Okay, so you say, I don't know if there's life under, uh, right. on other planets, and I don't either. Okay. And I don't either. But you believe it. So my next question is, what is the evidence that causes you to believe this? Okay, so now I might say something like, well, the reason I believe it is we have an unimaginably vast universe. Uh, we might even be living in an infin infinite universe. Um, life as we know it, we are, we are on one tiny speck of this universe. And life as we know it has developed by various causes, natural causes, in the universe. What is the actual likelihood that is this event, remotely improbable though it might be, and we can't say what the probability of it is, but let's just say it's one in a hundred million. But we live in a universe that's vastly bigger than that. Mm -hmm. So what are the odds that this combination of attributes called human beings exists nowhere else in this vast universe. Not just human beings that are like us, but life of any sort at all. What's the probability of that? And let's say I think that that's improbable for the reasons I've just outlined, and therefore I believe it. I don't know it. I, if you ask me to, to produce an alien, I can't. But I would argue my belief is in no way irrational. No, now, no, no. 
Now, you might say, I'm going to wait until the alien walks on stage, and then I'll believe it, uh, or because your, your reason for disbelief may require much higher degrees of certainty than mine are. But I would argue, in, in me believing it and you not believing it or awaiting the evidence, I, this is a, a fake pomposity that comes out of just saying, because I don't know for sure, Therefore, some of my belief is more rational than Dinesh's, even though Dinesh has all kinds of good reasons for believing what he does. Of course, if, we, if, if empirical evidence shows up, I'll be as open as you to pay attention to it. But I'm not in some epistemological second-class status because I believe something for which I have my own reasons, even though there's not empirical proof. Okay. So the example that you gave, first of all, at some point, somebody can go back through this video and find the number of times that he says what my position is likely to be uh, versus how many times I've tried to even attempt what your position is. I actually ask. So if you're just going to set up straw men, it's going to be really easy for me to knock them down. No, no, I mean, I'm no, sorry. We, every I... time you do that, you say, you could say this. And here's the thing. The examples that you're talking about, we live in this vast universe. What are the likelihoods? What are the odds? Right. You know, all this stuff. Great, great question. And there are things that we can address with data. But the, the belief that results from that, the belief that results from that is not, I believe, the, 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 the justified belief from that is not, I believe there is life outside of Earth or intelligent life outside of Earth. We'll stick with that. The warranted belief is, I believe that there is a likelihood consistent with the data of life outside of that. That's different than this is the case. Okay? I agree with that. Sure. And this is what I'm saying. It's the example that you're giving is fine. The summation is perhaps sloppy in the sense that we're not distinguishing between I believe there's life outside of Earth versus I believe that the data show that there's a likelihood of this. Because my response to that is to say, I think that that is a good estimation of the data that we have. And by the way, I think we can go further because we can look at something like the Drake equation, which will evaluate those things about what the probability is and right. also considering the, the likelihood of when, when technologies get so advanced, are they more likely to you know, destroy themselves or die from not paying attention to climate change or, or whatever. Um, sorry. Well, no. <laughs> you know, I, but, I, hang on. But when, when we do that, I'm, I'm, I strive to be as careful as I can with what I say. To not overreach, to not pretend that, I mean, I pretend to read minds on stage, but not to pretend I can read minds in this stuff. And to also say, I should have a discrete position that is clear based on the evidence. And if that, per current, position, if that current position is the evidence does not warrant a position, so there may be plenty of good evidence to suggest that life probably, in some form, occurs throughout the galaxy. We, we have found the building box of life out in space from exploration. So it would seem likely that possibly there is life, whether it's intelligent life, you know, whether, what, what's possible, who knows outside there. That's one thing. But to say, I believe there is intelligent extraterrestrial life just based on the likelihood that we're not necessarily alone, it doesn't rise to that level. It's about being consistent in, with the data. I'll try to illuminate the point by pivoting into politics because I think that yeah, we sometimes have. when we talk about God and religion, we, esta we establish sort of special distinctions and categories that are not normal in everyday life. So I'll, I'm going to throw out a bunch of beliefs. Okay. Um, I believe it's likely that Trump will be reelected. I do too. Uh, I believe that if Bernie were elected the day after the stock market would take a severe hit. A, a more severe hit than it has in the last couple of days? Yeah, probably. Because, because, because Bernie would be a walking virus for four years. I, I, I um, don't believe that, but that doesn't mean that I'm convinced you're wrong. Correct. So what I'm getting at here is, now again, uh, I'm, I'm making these statements of I believe. I believe that if, if Trump is re-elected, the market will do well over four years. Uh, but when I say these things, I'm making, I'm stating beliefs anchored in my knowledge of politics, there's, not, to my, I'm not, there's no empirical fact that I'm leaving out. And it would mean no objection to these beliefs for you to say to me somehow, Dinesh, uh, my position on this is actually rather Jesuitical. I draw a distinction between warranted belief and beliefs that are ultimately don't have sufficient warrant. I would say, we're talking about the future. 
Matt. None of us knows, I grant that. In that sense, it resembles life after death. We're, we're plugging in all the data we have and we're making a judgment about something that affects our life, just like life after death does. We have to act upon it because we have investments and portfolios. We have to cast our own vote. So we're going to make decisions about the future based on what we think is going to happen. My belief is in no way irrational because I cannot have either certitude about it or I don't have the kind of empirical evidence that would enable me, in some senses, to declare the belief warranted. No, it I, is warranted. So, first of all, here we go again. Uh, I don't disagree. The thing is, is that you're making, you have beliefs about what's likely to happen in the, in the economic and political realm, and you base it on actual data. I, I have no objection to that at all. But this, I think, gets to the heart of where and how you and I are dramatically different. Not just in epistemology and what may or may not warrant uh, believing in something without evidence, because I can't imagine both acknowledging, I have no evidence, but I believe it anyway. Uh, that's not the same thing as what we're talking about now. You have a lot of evidence. You have market research. You have other information. You know what's likely to happen. You know where the majority of, of people are, uh, you know, what, what they're looking forward to. Here's, here's the marked difference between the two of us. At every instance tonight, when we, when we got to something that was potentially um, political or that was about policy, you went to money. Where are they spending their money? Are they building this on the coast? What are the markets going to do? What is this going to do? I don't give a rat's ass about money. I give a rat's ass about human beings. And as a humanist, I'm looking at how the world can be better with policies that lift people up. And I'm not talking about, you know, I'm, I'm not, I have no problem with Bernie. I, I voted for him before. I'm not a Bernie or Buster. I'm not a Bernie bro. Matter of fact, they know the crap out of me. Uh, and yet, I, I will be supporting probably, almost certainly, whoever the Democratic nominate, nominee is uh, for a number of reasons. But I think the big one is, I have a focus that is on human beings and doing whatever we can to lift people up and not to make rich people richer or to make markets just better so that we can say we made markets better. Because if the market goes nuclear and just... We're, it's not like we're not already the wealthiest country as it is, but if we all got, you know, if we if all got wealthier, if the, if the United States market just went through the roof, I don't think we've lifted all boats. I think the gap in income, the gap in wealth, the gap in value of human beings is widening, and I don't think focusing on the market is the fix for that. Okay. First of all, in the, in the two or three times that I've cited markets, my purpose in citing them was as mechanisms of information. In other words, a market is a sign of how seriously people with money, who have to put their money on the line, take a piece of data, right? So I'm not using the market as the market is always right. I'm simply using the market as if people really thought this was going to happen, they would start moving their cash. And that's just a, a fact about people. Sure, right? I, I have a agree. Okay. If somebody really thought this is what the market was going to do, that's where they'd move their cash. Exactly. But what they think about the truth has no bearing on what the truth is. Just like the number of people who believe something, how strongly uh, okay, they believe you said it, that. whether they're going to... Okay. That, that's not a thing. Now, you, you threw this contrast up between... You mentioned the issue of inequality... Yeah. And you said you don't care about markets, you care about people. That, I was being hyperbolic. Hyperbolic. Point. But, but let's, let, let's of zoom into I that a little markets. bit. It's not like you throw it out. Of course. But, but what I was, was going to say is this. The reason, and I agree, by the way, we have more inequality now than we had, for example, in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And it is true also that CEOs and entrepreneurs today make a lot more money as a multiple, let's say, of the average worker than they did in the 70s. The reason for that, I think, is because CEOs in the 70s didn't do a whole lot. If you were a CEO of Hewlett Packard uh, or a Ford Motor Company, by and large, your job is organizational. You're an administrator. You say, I'll open a new plant over here. I'll do this over there. The entrepreneurs who have made gargantuan amounts of cash, I would mention you know, the obvious ones, even Bloomberg, uh, but certainly uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, certainly Steve Jobs, the reason that they got so rich 
is precisely because they have augmented human welfare to such a gargantuan degree. Everybody who has, see, people didn't even, we, normally we think of markets as responding, supply response to demand. But as far as I know, there's not one person in the world who wrote Steve Jobs and goes, you know what, take an ordinary phone, you know, figure out how it can take photos, uh, let's figure out how it can do email, uh, texting, put all these features and then get rid of the stylus, use your finger. Here's what I'm getting at. Apple built the phone before we knew we couldn't live without it. Sure. And everybody who put I money... I can, though, because I'm on Android. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, fair enough. But what I'm getting at is everybody who made these people like Bezos and, and, and Jobs so rich did it happily by waiting in long lines in the Apple store because of great boosts in human welfare that they were able to create. So I would argue we're living in an entrepreneurial boom. Now, the last time this happened is in the era that progressives called the Gilded Age, but the Gilded Age is also the age of the telegraph, the car, the airplane. So that was actually the, the biggest communication revolution of all time. We're living through the second biggest one. And all I'm getting at is these are huge amounts of human welfare that have been created by entrepreneurs for which they're being rewarded voluntarily by people who are happy to pay $300 to get a phone. So where, where does the social injustice come from? Oh, okay. Who who is who is Steve Jobs ripped off? How many how many phones does Steve actually manufacture? A lot. Zero. Steve Med Jobs never manufactured a phone in his life. Well, Apple, Apple yes. contracts. So what? I'm in agreement with you. Entrepreneurs, by all means. I mean, how many cars you, you, did, did did Henry Ford himself personally make? Yep. Uh, uh, I agree. The it was, thing it was is, done by the assembly line. If we're gonna if we're gonna determine how much the invention itself is important. And there are certainly entrepreneurs who, who are as self-made as possible. Uh, however, uh, that's not the sum total of wealth. And it doesn't mean that if I invent something and then have 25,000 employees, some of which I don't give a particularly good living wage to, manufacture those phones so that I can make as much money as possible off of my invention, that I'm actually doing something that is in the best benefit of society or that is boosting society. And, 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 who, who, and you get to decide that. You, a magician, sure I do. sitting here, decide, here's a voluntary transaction. Well, let, let's, let's elaborate the example so we can see capitalism in its pure form. Let's just say everyone in this audience has $10. So we live in a socialist utopia. We all have 10 bucks, okay? And then you stand up and do a magic trick and you say, I'll do this magic trick if, if some of you would agree to pay me a dollar. Okay, and let's just, say, let's just say the 25 people in the audience said, we'll give you a dollar. So everybody else clears the room, you do the magic trick, they give you a dollar. Our perfect equ equality is now interrupted by inequality, right? What, wait, what's inequality? Because in that example, Hold on. So the, I manufactured 100% yes, of did. the magic myself. Correct, but, but, but here's the point. The point, the point is that, well, you might have had an assistant and you bought equipment and you might have bought that at cheap prices and so on. We'll leave all that aside. The main point is that the guy who gave you the dollar thought your magic trick must be worth at least a dollar. Yes, but I'm not complaining about the person who willingly gives Apple money for their phone. Okay, so... so or, and I'm not, by the way, I'm not ragging on Apple or the iPhone or any of that. Right. I'm saying, yes, there are entrepreneurs and yes, there are people who justifiably go from nothing to immense wealth. I'm not objecting to wealth. I'm not advocating for an absolute equality where everybody gets $10 and that's all you're ever going to get. Oh, but, but, you're, but you're stepping aside. Let's take Walmart. The ordinary guy who works in Walmart at the, at the cash register makes $25,000 a year. That's the average pay at Walmart for a cash register guy. The managers at Walmart make about two hundred grand. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the family that owns Walmart makes a killing, as you know. Here's my question. Who are you... These are people who voluntarily show up for work. They could go work at Target. They choose to work at Walmart. They could be at the cashier at, uh, at Vaughn's or at Kroger's. They want to be at Walmart. They take the best job they have. There's an agreement between them and Walmart about how much to be paid. They should be paid for. All I'm saying is, where do you get to waltz in and say things like baseball players make too much? And I didn't say that. Okay. 
uh, or that Apple should be paying more money to its managers because Steve Jobs made more than they did. It's not because Steve Jobs made more than they did. Basically, you're saying, where do I get off coming in yeah. when these people voluntarily work? Right. And so that if we can get them to work for $1.50 an hour, so that they have to work five jobs and they... they, they but but, but they, pause here. Right. Let's no, check the on, language. Hang on. I, get I just let you talk on, on and on about okay, it. Okay, go ahead. You're suggesting that, that who am I to say that it's a bad move for us to pay some people so little, so little to pay a, a cash register work $25,000 a year? I can tell you who I am to say that. I am someone who may end up in that position, but I'm also someone who may have family members in that position, who may have friends in that position. I'm also somebody who lives and works in a society that benefits from them, and I benefit from them staying healthy and productive in society. It's not it's to pretend that the massive wealth disparity is all down to somebody had a really good idea and other people agreed to work for a pittance, and that's just fine, it may be true that some people had a good idea and some people work for a fitness, but that doesn't mean it's just fine. It doesn't mean it leads to a better society. It doesn't mean that people can afford health care. And if they can't afford health care, then guess what? They're potentially getting me sick. If they can't, this is why we were, this is why the government steps in to suggest that you need to vaccinate your kids because vaccines don't freaking cause autism. They protect and save lives. I know you didn't say I, I, that. I, yeah. This is this is something I would trumpet. And there are people out there who can't have vaccines who depend on herd immunity. And similarly, they need the person who's checking them out, handling their money, giving them back their change, that when they cough on their hand and hand it back to them, that they at least have the same opportunities that healthcare should be a basic human right. And if it's not, then we definitely have to pay people more. The number one cause of bankruptcy in the United States. The, the issue of healthcare is worth focusing on for a moment because to me, the problem of healthcare is really simple. Um, the, the this is where we talk about Trump. I, I didn't say the solution. I didn't say the solution. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I said fine. the problem. The problem of healthcare can be summarized in this way: the guy who receives the service is not only not paying for it, but he has no idea what it costs, and it never occurs to him or her to ask what it costs. And this crucial fact is known by every provider of healthcare who recognizes that a third man, not present here, is paying for it. And it's gonna be very easy to screw that guy because he's not here. And so we will be sending him a bill which could be as gargantuan as we like because the guy getting the service is never gonna show the slightest interest in the social cost being borne by that third guy. Let's call him the taxpayer. So it's a ripoff it, it, yeah. scheme engineered ultimately, and, 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 and everything would, would work like healthcare if we allowed it to. You said healthcare is a right. Well, I would say eating is a right. I have a right to eat. I shouldn't starve. I'm, I live in a prosperous country. So let's say I were to tell you, all right, you have a right to food. When you go to Vaughn's to, uh, to, to fill your cart, just take what you think you need um, and go to the counter, and then they'll just check you out. And so you look at the milk, and milk was, you know, normally it's uh, $2.50, and you buy two cartons. You say, I'll buy 10, because I'm not paying. So you fill up your cart. You show up at the counter. Now, here's the important point. Your behavior is completely understandable. You're taking as much as you can. The guy behind the counter, by which I mean the management, they realize that the guy in the line is not paying. So they realize milk doesn't have to cost $2.50. It could cost 25 bucks. Why? Because that guy's not going to ask, and he's not going to care. And so, as long as we get to shaft some third guy who's going to be paying for it, we're going to jack up the prices. And what I'm trying to say is that that's a meta in all the areas where we want entitlements, that's the scam that we've been subjected to. Colleges. Why do you think my daughter went to Dartmouth? Cost me 63 Because you did. Because I did. Uh, yeah. um, Yes, yes. If you ask the easy questions, I got to take them because I know I'm going to get them right. Yes, that's, that's an easy one. And, but why does college, in an, in an age where technology should make educational delivery services easier, in an age where colleges already have gigantic endowments, why these high bills? And the answer is really simple. The guy who's walking in the door is not paying. 
the college knows he's got a $10,000 Pell Grant. He's got all these loans, people willing to put. Them. So what we do is even though inflation is 0% or 1%, we're going to increase our fees 20% every year for the past 30 years. Why? Because we are conspiring with the student and his family to screw the third man who's not here. So what I'm trying to get at is that. Hang on. Hang on. You are, exactly, exactly. And, and, and so either you are aware of this and will be voting for Trump, or you're a happy sucker who wants to pay even more, who wants to pay even more because he is okay with this collective ripoff scheme. Yeah, so, true. but if the guy who got the services was paying our healthcare, let's think of it this way. Let's say the government were to say, all right, the people that you're, th you're worried about who go bankrupt, they do that because of catastrophic health situations, right? Catastrophic health situations are, I need a heart surgery, uh, I need a new lung, uh, and this is going to cost $100,000, I don't have $100,000. What I'm saying is we could insure the entire American population against catastrophic events, kind of like hurricanes and so on, except in this case disease, and allow people to pay, at least people who are not poor people on Medicaid, pay their routine health care bills. Wait, are you okay with Medicaid? I'm okay with Medicaid for the poor who can't afford it, yes. Socialist. No, it's not socialist. <laughs> no, I know. It's just I'm, I'm a safety netist. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just waiting. Yeah. There's a couple points I have to address. Okay, so the, the point I'm trying to make is in, a, in an American health care system where we paid our routine health care bills mm -hmm. and the government insured us against catastrophic illness, you would magically begin to see Healthcare prices plummet. You go to the doctor, he goes, I'm going to run seven tests. You're like, really, seven tests? Just because I have a cold and a sore throat? What are the seven tests? Why do I need seven tests? Suddenly, the guy next door would be offering four tests and, and half the price. And I'd walk across the street because I'm paying. If the government gave us a $10,000 healthcare voucher and said to you, listen, if you can spend it on all, all on healthcare, but if you only spend 1000 you can pocket the other nine. Notice the tremendous behavioral change that would sweep across this country. Suddenly, people would demand to know what healthcare should cost, and it would change the system. So that's all I'm saying. You're, you're fighting a caricature, whereas I'm saying there are better ways to run these things and deliver the safety net we want. And... I think Trump represents that. It's not obvious he does, but that's what he does. Um, I would agree. Hey, it's Matt, not, we have time for your, your, your response here. Yeah, but, uh, I got we'll to respond to this. We'll have to wrap up after that. Uh, yeah, because... Um, so, A... Wow. I just lost like half my train of thought right there. As soon as we mentioned Trump, it just happens every time. Uh, okay. So... There are things about the system that I, I'm going to completely agree with you. I'm not denying the facts. Um, there are certain things about what you said where you're talking about uh, the guy going in for services is not paying for it. The unfortunate fact is that there are, there are guys who are going in who are paying for it directly um, because of problems with insurance and other things. It's not always just the insurance. Now, the, the, the prices, I agree with you on, on the economics of how, how this ends up happening and how they end up raising. The problem is, is that there are also guys who aren't paying for it because they can't afford it. They don't have insurance. They can't get it. And the example that you came up with of uh, going into the grocery store and taking what you need, um, first of all, we could have a conversation about food, but... I'm not going to go in for three root canals just because they're free. I'm not going to go in to have 15 gallbladders removed just because I'm not paying Let's for pause it. right there. So I, I agree no, with those examples, but no, they're misleading examples. No, they're not your typical. example was monumentally no. misleading to suggest that it's somehow the problem that if we start giving people health care, that they're going to necessarily take advantage of it, even though we know human, be human behavior will have people take advantage of it, not in the way of let me grab as much milk as I can. That was my problem with the example. There right. are ways to fix the system to lower the prices so that we're not, because by the way, the insurance companies are not getting screwed. They're making money. And so the guy who goes in who's not paying for it, it's not the insurance guy that's getting screwed, it's everybody else. And the other thing is, if the doctor tells me I need seven tests, and this doctor tells me I need four tests, and I'm not a doctor, what if one of those three tests is what I actually need? This, this is the problem because we have people who are 
Okay, yeah, there's people who are lazy, lazy thinkers, and people. But generally, I don't have time to become an expert on everything. No, you don't. And so I have to rely on experts. And so if the doctor says I need seven tests, going to the guy that's got four tests doesn't mean I've done anything to improve the likelihood that I'm going to be healthy. It just means I saved a couple dollars. And if the focus is on getting me healthy, and we change the way the health system works so that people can go in and get whatever tests the medical community feel are necessary to best diagnose their thing, to, to best diagnose their issue, that's what we should be aiming for. I'm not proposing any solution. I'm not an economist. I don't necessarily buy into what you know, I individuals are saying. I'm just saying if we're going to use examples, let's put the blame where it should be. Let's put, let's put the responsibility where it should be. It's not somebody coming in to screw over their insurance company because they're in pain. And the insurance company is going to pass on that cost to all of us. So the real scam, from my perspective, and I fully acknowledge that I could be monumentally wrong here, is that you want to call it a scam in that there's a conspiracy amongst the medical community to scam the insurance community out of as much money as they can. And my view is that it's a scam in the sense that we've convinced people that healthcare needs to be expensive and that it's not something that people should have access to. And if we just point to the, this is the scam, the true scam is when we make it so that there are people who are dying for treatable things. Because the person who goes in to get their flu shot protects you and me too. Of course. And it helps us to have a healthier society. It's not 15, it's not 10 gallons of milk. And by the way, there are people who need probably 10 gallons of milk. Um, they have way more kids than I'm ever going to have. I'm never going to have kids. And once upon a time, I had this notion of, why the hell should my tax dollars go to somebody else's kids going through school? That's, that's, yeah, but that's not what I'm saying. But they should go to that because those kids are part of my community. They're going to be the ones that are working. They're going to be the ones that are curing my, the, whatever cancer I end up with in 20 years. It's worth it, even though I don't have kids, to provide and contribute to the society that I benefit from. Which I don't think you deny. I don't deny that at all. That was, that was me preaching. That's something yeah, I don't think you uh, deny. Right. So we, we, we shouldn't knock straw men here. The... The... The scam of healthcare. Hold my beer. The scam of healthcare. <laughs> the scam of healthcare, at least Obamacare, was a scam between the government and the insurance companies against the American people. And here's what I mean um, Obama went to the healthcare companies, which he knew would oppose Obamacare because it involved greater federal control. And Obama basically said, listen, guys, I'm going to give you the greatest profit windfall in your history. Why? I'm going to force every living American to buy health insurance. It's not optional. It's kind of like if I were to force every American to buy broccoli. The broccoli industry would be orgasmic with delight. So you are going to be making money hand and foot because there are a lot of people, young people particularly, who may not even need insurance. They're perfectly healthy. They can make a decision for themselves about whether they want it and what kind of insurance they want. I'm going to shove it down their throat whether they want to or not. In exchange for this profit windfall, I want you to lobby for Obamacare. I want you to fund my campaign. So we will go into this together. And so all the insurance companies, if you notice, were all for Obamacare, running ads for Obamacare. Why? Because Obamacare was a scam perpetrated between the government and the industry, not the first time in history, by the way, on the American people. That's point one. Point two, the vast majority of our health care budget goes on older people. Not surprisingly, that's when you need the most health care. But that's when your root canal example completely breaks down. Because anybody who is in the healthcare industry or works in a hospice or even works in a hospital as a nurse dealing with old people recognizes that we have a massive problem in our society, and it may be more unique to Western society, of loneliness. Loneliness. Old people, by and large, don't live with their kids. They don't see their grandkids. So, so because of loneliness, healthcare becomes a form of counseling, of therapy. I need this, I need that. Mr. And first of all, I'm in favor of counseling and therapy, especially for the elderly. No, but, but well, I'm just saying it, it, is a, it is an empirical fact, and you're all about empirical facts in the world. It's an empirical fact that the demand for healthcare 
in the elderly community sure. is huge. And a lot of it, and some of us may know this from personal example, pe that people like to see the doctor because A, they like to, because the doctor is first of all one of the few people who takes a direct personal interest in them, will spend by and large as much time as they want get it. with the doctor because he's billing. I, I get it. So all I'm getting at is this. It's not like a root canal. You and I hate to see the doctor. We hate to see the dentist. We would never go for any reason other than we are being dragged there by our spouse or whatever. But I'm saying there are lots of people who like going to the doctor, who like to actually discuss their ailments, who think they have more ailments than they actually have. If you can show... If, I can if you can show that this is a significant contributor to healthcare prices, I'll buy you a steak dinner. Okay. If all I right. can show you. Okay. I think that it's good to end on that. That's a good deal. Thank you all. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.